What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another video. In today's video, we are back with another episode of Lions Latest. We're going to the latest Detroit Lions news, and we are back with another training camp update video. Day number four is in the books. The first week is in the books of Lions training camp, and I was there today, so let's get it started. I'm fired up. It's made a great decision. Great teammates, coaches, and other people who want to be Super Bowl champions, and we are. We're going to do it this year. And we're going places, because we want to go places. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! Before long, we're they going to be the last one standing. Welcome, everybody, to our video. Glad you guys are here. And, man, we are back with another training camp update video. This is a pretty exciting one because I was at practice today, so a lot of these notes are my own notes from today's practice. And I think the coolest thing was the two coolest things that I thought happened at practice didn't take place during practice, like on the field. So we're going to talk about those. With that being said, let me give a couple of shout-outs. First off, shout to my man Michael Banks, of course, for getting me in there. Shout-out to you, Michael Banks. I appreciate it. It was a great time. I know you're going to have some pictures to send, so shout-out to you. Also, shout-out to the people that said, what's up? So if you guys see me at training camp or wherever, say what's up if you want to. I mean, I appreciate it. It's always cool. My man that got the Tom Kennedy sign ball, that was cool. My guy that said he comments, he's been commenting on some of my videos. Hey, man, comment on this video. That way I can see it. With that being said, shout out to you guys. I appreciate it. So, yeah, if you guys see me there, say what's up. You'll, you'll spot me by the hat. I'm always... So with that being said... I'm probably going to give some more shout outs as we go through this video, but a lot of these are my own notes. Now, I do want to say this. I didn't have maybe the best angle to see for a lot of their 11 on 11 drills that they did that was on the other side of the field, and they actually flipped it back to what it was like last year. So I didn't have necessarily the best angle, but you know, going forward, I'll probably be sitting on that side, so that won't be an issue. But our entire group was on the other side, so you know, I just stuck around there. And you know, there was just a lot going on because this was like the first day back, so there was just a lot going on. It was a lot of excitement. Obviously, the Hard Knocks crew was there. Which which was pretty sweet to see that there was just a lot going on a lot of fans there i thought that was awesome the turnout was incredible but that being said i gotta hit on two things before we even get into some of my practice notes and some of my participation updates because i think the two coolest things that took place did not happen on the practice field and those two things are first off if you guys follow me on twitter you saw the little post that i put up there the picture with brad holmes hey if you haven't follow me on twitter at, at zero dose of deer uh that was the craziest thing i did not expect to see brad holmes shout out to him i know he was with his family he was with his kid he was with his wife so i appreciate him for you know taking the time to take a picture i do uh with that being said though i did not anticipate he was going to be walking around that corner we were there you know a little bit after practice talking and all of a sudden here comes brad holmes and i'm like hold up and i literally I, like like this i was you know like you see a player and you can kind of usually tell it's a player this was one of those situations where i kind of froze for a second i was like is that brad holmes is that really brad holmes standing right there like what this is crazy like i i did i felt i was like this is nuts that brad holmes is right there so we got his detention we talked to him for a little bit and that was awesome it's just like the coolest thing of training camp to get a picture with Brad Holmes. First off, we all we all love Brad Holmes' energy and you know what he's done, and we we made that clear to him. And then of course you got Michael Banks. Who, if you don't know, the guy's you know he's a little bit optimistic, but he believes it, man. He he says the Lions are going 14 and three this year. He says you know we're gonna beat the Bills on Thanksgiving. He just doesn't know where those three losses are gonna come into play. And he brought that up to Brad Holmes. Brad Holmes he loved it. He loved the 14 and three prediction. We're going to shock the world on Thanksgiving. I was like, oh, snap, stop it. Look, we're already here. I'm already pumped up. I already got some autographs, some selfies, whatever. And now you're telling me this? If you don't know, we play the Bills on Thanksgiving. We're going to shock the world. We saw Rod Wood there. He wasn't really, like, engaging in the Super Bowl comments and things like that. He's like, man, we're going to shock the world on Thanksgiving. I'm like, oh, snap, you got to stop because now you got me even more pumped up. So shout out to Brad Holmes. I really appreciate that picture. That was the coolest thing. Seriously, I mean, I got to get that thing printed off. That was the coolest thing the other coolest thing that i think took place uh also was getting a picture with sheila hamp the lions owner right now i mean that was crazy now i've seen sheila hamp at practice before i think it was at training it must have been at training camp years back on a golf cart with her mom i don't know when that was because of covid and stuff either way i've seen her there but not that close up like she was you know she came up to us and i don't know if she went to the other sections or not but i can tell you this and i gotta give a lot of credit to sheila hamp 
man, she went around. She took her time. She had a guy with her that was taking pictures, if you wanted a picture with her. And she took her time. She, she signed everything. She talked to everybody. She's not kind of just in and out. Like, okay, hey, how you doing? Keep walking. Let's, let's not engage. Like, nah, she went through that line, man, while practice was going on. That being said, there's a couple things that we know about what Sheila Hamp has done so far. And we'll see if the results come along with it. But I have absolutely loved the way that she's handled the situation since she's taken over. In terms of going back to the coaching search, finding your head coach and finding your general manager. To kind of take that responsibility on. Understanding that she is the owner of the team, right? This is your team. That's your big decision that you have to make. You have to find the guys that run this team. And instead of relying upon, and it's not to say don't get help, right? Don't use other voices, whether that was a Rod Wood or whether that was you know using a Chris Buman to help aid her and help guide her towards the decision to bring in a Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes but she didn't necessarily go out and say hey who should we hire oh hey we recommend this guy all right let me hire him it wasn't that situation and I love the way that Sheila Hamp kind of took that on this offseason like she went out and she made that hiring and you have to do that because it starts with that from the very top and that is the very top is what Sheila Hamp is doing. And of course, now we know that how hard knocks this season, we have the draft in 2024. But just in terms of this team alone and the way she's built it, because we talked about this a lot, I don't want to go too into detail, but I do love the fact of the way that she handled that situation, finding the head coach, finding the general manager, understanding that, yeah, you're the owner of this team, you know, this is something that you should make the decision on. You should feel really good. These these should be your guys to the point where you're very confident in them, where you're going to give them the resources that they need, where you can see the vision. And I just don't see how you can judge a head coach or a general manager unless things are absolutely outstanding or they're absolutely awful on whether or not they're reaching and achieving the milestones and goals that they have set out if you don't understand the plan or the vision that they've put in place. And I believe heavily that's why we've had issues like that in the past where maybe guys were fired too early, maybe they're fired too late, whatever it may be, usually not too late, but just where you get some of these knee-jerk decisions, which I think can happen if you're not involved and you don't see the plan and you don't see the picture, you don't see the vision. Sheila, who was booed at halftime when Kelvin Johnson had his ceremony and I was just, you know, I felt awful for her. I was like, man, this is terrible. Just, just how loud it was, the boos. I won't go into all of that. We talked about that when that situation happened, but to see her out there engaging with the fans like she is, I think is outstanding because to me, she has that confidence and, and trust and belief in the guys that she's hired right? She wants to continue to be around it. She's bought in. She believes in these guys. And I think you have a lot of self-confidence when you make that decision, right? When you're as involved as she is and she's going out there, you know, taking pictures, doing all of these things. We understand the history, all of those things, but Sheila is not everybody else and how everything has happened in the past. Sheila has done it her way. And I love the way that she's handled the situation by kind of taking that accountability to make the right hires, to make the right decisions. And we'll see if it ultimately pays off, but I can't fault you for doing that and taking the time to go out and, you know, understand it, learn what do we need, right? Figure out what do we actually need because this is your responsibility as an owner, right? You own a company. It's your responsibility to find what do we need to do? Who do we need to hire, right? I mean, that's that you're at the top of the line. So it does start with you. And I love the way that she's handled that. Since then, we all hear about the involvement that she's had. Doing things like this, I think, is outstanding. And I've, I've never seen something like this before. And I, I think that's just incredible. And it speaks to all of the culture and all these things we hear talked about. It. I think it stems from the very top down. I think it always does. The very top down. And that is Sheila Hamp. And everything else is a reflection of Sheila Hamp. And the way that she has handled this situation, I think, has been outstanding. And we'll see how the results go and how you know they end up shaking out. But I definitely love the way that she's handled it to this point and putting that trust in these guys because they are your guys, right? It's easy to fire a guy after two years and you don't see maybe the wins that you want to see when you didn't even go out there and find the guys necessarily. Someone just told you to hire him and you hired him. It's a completely different situation. So shout out to Sheila for that. I thought that was outstanding. I thought those were the coolest things. It really just gave you, gave you a feel of... I don't know, culture, whatever it may be, just it just it just felt different to see Sheila like that taking pictures of school and of course see Brad Holmes. Uh, it was super lucky, you know, to have him come around and just 
like, oh my gosh, Brad Holmes is right there. Now, I do have a couple of participation notes that we will dive into before I get into some of my practice notes today. Let's take a look at it. So, not a lot of changes to the pup list or the NFI list. Uh, the main one being that Dan Skipper has been taken off of this list. He has passed his physical. He has cleared his physical. This player was on there due to illness. The offensive tackle, he has been taken off of this list. So, that's good. All right. Hey, I was getting a little bit concerned there. I was like, man, how long are you to be on this with an illness? That's concerning. He has now been taken off this list, which is great news. Also, Devin Funches had kind of a rest day, did not participate today. Taylor Decker had the day off today. He did not practice. We saw the same thing last offseason where certain veterans would get rest days. It looks like that's what Taylor Decker had today. In his place, Penny Sewell moved to left tackle, so they continued to do that. And they put Matt Nelson at right tackle, and the back of left tackle was Obina Eze. So it seems like that's the rotation they like the best right now, unless someone can emerge like an Obina Eze into that left tackle position, where if there was no Taylor Decker, you trust him enough to hold down left tackle, which is one of the most valuable positions on your team that way Penny Sewell could stay at right tackle someone's really got to shine for something like that to be the case but as of now they're kind of sticking with what they did last season we didn't get an update on Greg Bell CJ Moore from what I saw today very interactive very very involved engaged with everything that's going on in each drill he doesn't look far off I mean I saw him really like like mimicking the drill off to the side that they were doing and he also had like a call sheet with him so super engaged it seemed like with his positional group and he was kind of mimicking some of the drills off to the side I would doubt that he's super far out I'm assuming at some point he's going to get back there and also Jamison Williams who has continued to walk around with the football I absolutely love this guy's energy and Dan Campbell showed himself love today with you know him carrying around the ball how engaged Engaged he has been you know how he's always asking questions how he's talking about okay if I'm in this situation you know here's what I would do and all those things off to the side but also he said he's very optimistic because the player has been putting in his time right getting there early doing the rehab doing the workouts to get strength which is what Dan Campbell said that they're looking for for Jamison Williams is to build back that strength so that he can protect himself he said he's putting in all of that time and he said once he's on the football field you know, we know what he can be with the hand, with, with the ball in his hands, and he just loves to have the ball in his hands, and he walks around with it. Aside from that, on the pup list, no changes there. Because Jason Cabinda is still out with the ankle injury, uh, Garrett Griffin was kind of playing the little bit of the H-back role today. He's playing in two tight end sets. He's working with the first team. Garrett Griffin's a guy to definitely keep the eye on, depending on how serious the injury is for Jason Cabinda. I think a lot of us kind of just wrote it off that he probably wouldn't make the team. But if Jason Cabinda is injured and they feel comfortable with him being able to possibly play that kind of role, because again, if you remember, with New Orleans, very flexible blocker, movement blocking piece. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. And with that, the rest of it pretty much the same. We did see Josh Pascal today. He was walking around giving out autographs, so I would say that's good news. But he wasn't practicing. He wasn't in uniform or anything like that. I guess Amani and Jeff Okuda collided on a crossing route. I didn't actually see that collision take place, but it took Amani out of practice. But with that being said, after practice that he said that he was fine. That's good news there. I didn't see that collision take place. Again, my angle wasn't the best, so I can't give you like the exact play-by-play -play when they went to a lot of their 11 on 11s but I definitely can give you some notes from what I saw also a couple positional notes first off John Kaminsky has been playing kind of like the strong defensive end at definitely in walkthroughs but in terms of versatility playing different spots kind of like Aiden Hutchinson that has been the case and I think the reason being is because John Kaminsky has the size to play as a strong defensive end to work against tackles but he's also to me probably more effective in the film that I've seen in the past as an interior pass rusher so I think that's where you get the flexibility we know Aiden Hutchinson who is just outstanding but Aiden Hutchinson can rush from the inside and the outside with his background that he has with Michigan he had what would have been a sack today Austin Bryant kind of playing a little bit more as a weak side defensive end through walkthroughs he had multiple pressures Julian Okora showed up Charles Harris had some good reps Charles Harris also continues to show his versatility when dropping underneath in his own coverage which we know may be very necessary especially if he is played at some Sam backer on the line the defensive pressure was definitely there and while I couldn't always pinpoint who was actually getting the pressure and Taylor Decker again was not at left tackle so that led to some issues with Matt Nelson playing at right tackle I couldn't always tell who was actually getting the pressure, but I can say that there were definitely occasions where the ball did come out where there were still pressures and quarterbacks were forced to step up. There was one play where it was thrown deep by David Blau to Khalif Raymond. I believe it was David Blau, and there was a lot of pressure, and you could just see him kind of backing it up and heave it. It wasn't a terrible throw. It was just thrown deep and complete in one of their like situational drills, less than a minute to play. But with that said, you could definitely sense that there was definitely pressure there. And there were a couple of plays as well where they, you know, first read was definitely taken away. And they were kind of 
working through reads and being forced to find their checkdowns. So I would say that's good news without having, you know, the best visuals of it. And again, next week I'll have better visuals because I'll be sitting in a different spot. Kirby Joseph and Malcolm Rodriguez do seem to kind of be working up a little bit in terms of some of their roles defensively in the death chart. They do seem to be working up the death chart a little bit. Kirby Joseph, I specifically noticed through walkthroughs getting some much higher reps. Jay's Mitchell, we haven't really noticed much. It seems like because of the recovery from the injury, haven't really noticed him much practicing but those two guys I think you noticed they were kind of working their ways up the depth chart now offensively a couple of things that we have talked about probably seeing again this year just based on what we saw last year is definitely showing up and I can say one thing with that tempo was very very much so there now they did a couple of different 11 on 11 so I, I know one 11 on 11 it seemed like every single play was under center and then they mixed it up and they'd go like shotgun 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 so they were doing some different you know, type of personnel groupings and also just different alignments with the quarterback. But with that said, tempo was noticeable as every once in a while they would get out to the line quickly and snap it. Now, this is something that a lot of teams do. I, I watched old Patriots 2006. They did this. And we talked about the, the play calls and why you can do things like this. So tempo is definitely something that showed up when they went to the situational drills, which was what, less than a minute. You know, obviously in that position, yeah, tempo is always going to be up. But there was definitely times when they would break the huddle, get out there and snap it quickly. So you did sense some of that. I also sensed a lot of motions. Now, this is something that I've been looking for really since the last season and watching the film on Ben Johnson and what the Lions did because motions were a huge part of the Lions offense in terms of trying to find answers for your quarterback but also just setting up matchups finding mismatches getting players in certain alignments pre-snap right and then just giving the defense eye candy to follow right trying to get matchups for Amon Ross St. Brown to get him one-on-one -on -one. I thought one thing that stuck out is the way that they were getting Khalif Raymond the football right it wasn't just him running deep and running deep shot plays all the time over and over and over and we heard Seth Ryan say that he could kind of be our Jamison Williams while Jamison Williams is not here so you definitely see that the speed is noticeable but they seem to be utilizing him different where he may be more efficient in picking up chunk plays than he was last season because just running in vertical is tough we I don't even know if we hit any of those last season not to say he couldn't get open it was just a really tough shot for us to hit obviously he's on the shorter side so a lot of these play action rollouts crossing routes that seemed to be where they like to use him, especially against man coverage, and he showed a lot of effectiveness there. So getting him those same type of matchups, but finding a better way to utilize his skill set and get him more involved in the pass game seemed very noticeable in today's practice. And with that said, Khalif Raymond's making the team. All right, I don't want to go on a limb and say something that may come back and be completely off, but I'm going to say it. Khalif Raymond's going to end up making this team. Okay, now I know right now he's continuing to compete with Cleo Pippleton for punt return, so I'm not saying Pippleton can't make it. I'm just saying Khalif is going to make it because right now it seems like there's a top four, Josh Reynolds, DJ Chark, Amon Ross St. Brown, and Khalif Raymond. Those, those are the top four, right? Those are the top four receivers. Khalif Raymond is definitely in that. And while he kind of mixes around, Khalif Raymond seems to be definitely in that after practice. Well, I wouldn't say after practice, but the last 15 minutes, they broke up into special teams and everybody was kind of doing drills on their own, each positional group. The quarterbacks, Jared Goff was just throwing. It started off with him throwing a TJ Hawkinson, then DJ Tar Chark, and then it became those two, plus a little bit of Josh Reynolds and Khalif Raymond. That seems to be kind of the top four right now with Quintez Cephas and Trinity Benson kind of at five and six competing. Now, with that said, I can't necessarily speak to this, but apparently they both had a couple of mistakes today in terms of alignment issues for Quintez Cephas once and then also a wrong route ran by Trinity Benson. I mean, this is the time to have those kind of mistakes. You don't want to have mistakes, but I would say this is the time to do it. So, I mean, those are like mental mistakes that, yes, can be cleaned up. Definitely. And quit that Cephas can play. So I don't think him, you know, maybe if he lined up in the wrong spot, shot the pride of Detroit, they said that, that, you know, that would get him cut from the team or anything like that. The guy can play. We've seen him play. We know that the guy can play. But those seem to be the top four. So I'm pretty darn confident saying that I think Khalif Raymond's going to end up making this final man roster. But take with that what you want. I'll have to continue to watch more. And as I get more notes, I'll continue to share those with you. But I love the movement the Lions did pre-snap. And they did a lot of two motion plays where they would bring in a tight end and then they motion a receiver or they bring in a fullback they motion a receiver and you're getting a lot of different looks offensively there was even one time now we don't do this a ton but i've seen other teams again like the patriots do this where you come out let's say in single back then you make your adjustments golf comes back quarterback comes back to the gun running back can slide up right and you just give him an empty look you, you completely change it up at the line so there was I think one of those plays but a lot of movement pre-snap consistently trying to find matchups with that said though it's not like they were exploiting them every play when the Lions went under center it was clear there was a lot of play action and I anticipate that's probably what we're going to see a lot of this season because the Lions are going to bet on the fact that they can play through their run game and with 
outside receiving threats, they have to be able to make those guys efficient. They have to find a way to have those guys be involved and get big plays. That way they can continue to back up defenses. Because as we look at the statistics from last year, Lions were one of the best teams in football with the 12 personnel grouping. They ran the ball pretty darn well on the season, but it wasn't great yet. However, when they had outside receivers, they were way more efficient than when they didn't. When they didn't have Josh, when they didn't have Cephas, the Lions' 12 personnel yards per carry dropped to 1.6 yards between weeks 5 and 8. That is terrible. But when they had outside receiving presence, that changed big time. And the Lions, I think, anticipate that to change even more. Just think about the Titans. Derrick Henry. Well, what do they have on the outside? Guys like A.J. Brown, right? You got two big guys that can stretch the field and win on the outside. At one point, they had Khalif Raymond in there to take shots. The Lions showed a lot of play action today. What I noticed, not always did it work. I know there was one shot play that Jared Goff did where he was forced to check the ball down. It just was not there. But they did do a lot of play action, especially from under center. But even out of the gun, and you guys may have seen the clip on Twitter, Twitter of Tim Boyle doing the little shotgun play action rollout and then throwing it up to Tom Kenny with a one-handed snag that was cool that one got some cheers that one definitely got some cheers definitely saw some plays outside the numbers like this this one was pretty I remember seeing this towards the sideline that was just a really nice catch probably like 20 yards from golf good throw as well just came out real nice and you saw it whether it was a Quintus Cephas comeback route on a play action Outside the numbers. Picking out some individuals, Tracy Walker. Uh, Tracy Walker got some matchups with TJ Hawkinson, and he looked pretty good in coverage today from the safety position, matching up a tight end. That's kind of been a growth part of his game, I think, since last year. They put a really big emphasis on that, and he looked good. I mean, from just seeing one day of practice, he looked good matched up with TJ Hawkinson, really didn't give up a lot of airspace, and that that what there really what didn't seem to be a ton of success between Jared Goff and TJ Hawkinson today. We've heard past days there were, Today, it didn't seem like they were able to consistently hit that matchup when they went to it. There was a lot of very good coverage. There was one where it was Tracy Walker, great coverage, pass was thrown a little bit deep, incomplete. Then they came back, Alex Anzalone, good coverage, incomplete. They tried to get him vertical again. They were trying to hit these seam shots, these vertical shots. And so I didn't see TJ Jackson necessarily dominating. I think that's actually been something that's been brought up. But I would actually speak that more to the growth of what we're seeing within some of our players specifically. And also the ball being spread around a little bit more, specifically towards the receivers on the outside. Aiden Hutchinson. Dan Campbell gave Aiden Hutchinson a lot of credit. He said, you know, two rookies that have popped so far, Aiden Hutchinson. But certainly Hutch. I mean, I, I can't. It, he just, he pops, you know, and uh, to watch him just continue to work and go through it. And I'm telling you, every day he just gets a little bit better. And that's what, that's all you care about is that you just see a little bit of improvement every day. So certainly Hutch. Um, I would say Lucas Lucas has caught my eye, you know, and I would tell you it, per, particularly in the the special teams drills, that's where I really see it. Uh, the compete drills, and there's an awareness about him. Um, he's pretty instinctive, and uh, and he's aggressive, you know. And you got to be able to, you got to have all of that to be a good special teams player. The Lions open practice early with some kind of competitive, like almost races to the football lining up three players, having them race to scoop up the ball, and they like to do the same thing. Finish when you have the football score, and the same thing when there's a ball on the ground. Pick it up as the defender. They're always racing to the ball. He just has, right? And we all, okay, we're all in the Aiden Hutchinson hype train. There was a ton of Aiden Hutchinson jerseys, but he's been, he's popped a lot so far. And he also brought up Chase Lucas, which I thought was awesome. Chase Lucas, he actually said, has popped to him in special teams. And then you saw him in practice today. I believe he was matched up on John Johnson, but he was in the slot. It was an outbreaking route. He had great coverage. He allowed like no airspace. Pass was incomplete. Chase Lucas does look pretty fluid. It looks like he may end up being the backup slot position. And I could definitely see him making the team because again if Dan Campbell's saying look he's impressing on special teams and he can play and work his way up the depth chart on cornerback even if he's not getting reps there right now special teams can get you on the roster and Chase Lucas seems like he's in a pretty good spot right now now I can't really speak as much to the Aiden Hutchinson side because unfortunately like I said I couldn't really see who's getting pressure there was guys blocking that but shout out to Pride of Detroit they said that he had three straight wins and I knew there was pressure even when there wasn't sacks you could sense that there was pressure first play they did a screen to Aiden Hutchinson and that's the only time he was really walled out of the play however he came back later on the second 11 on 11 grouping he played at the left end position which meant going against Matt Nelson he got a pressure comes back next play Jonah Jackson in the inside who of course is at left guard then later he beats Penny Sewell on what was apparently one of the cleanest moves. It sounds like it was one of the outside stabs. Brought himself back inside with a swim move over top and got to the quarterback. Doesn't shock me. 
doesn't shock me. One of my favorite parts of 1800s in the game, the agility that he has, the ability to change directions, the balance that he plays with. It was a nightmare for teams last year. It was a nightmare for tackles because they always had to worry about that, right? You couldn't just set one way because he was going to use his agility to beat you inside or beat you outside. And specifically inside, he wrecked teams like Ohio State, just went crazy all day. So if you feel threatened at all that he can get the edge on you, Oh, it's, it's, it's a wrap. It's, it's just a wrap. He isn't the fastest guy off the edge, but it's a wrap that if he feels like he can. And right now, they're saying he just looks quick. The one he got Jonah Jackson, they pulled a guard, and his quick first step, he was just through the line. Aiden Hutchinson's different. I'm telling you, we did this Aiden Hutchinson breakdown. You can check it out. Definitely, we're still checking out. He is a different athlete, man. I'm so pumped to see Aiden Hutchinson. So I believe everything that was said there that he lit it up. And Dan Campbell also was saying the same thing. So completely believe it. With Jeff Okuda, saw a few good reps here for sure. First time, I saw him get beat by Khalif. I think he had like some sort of crossing route, like we said, and he got beat by Khalif just a little bit, gave up a completion. Then he came back later, and I saw him have a great pass breakup. There was one on an underneath like crosser, which was late in the play. Definitely didn't seem to be the first read. It could have been one of those situations where they just tried to draw you off and check it down underneath, but it seemed like it was a little bit later progression in the play, which is good. You're forcing the quarterback to work through progressions for a secondary, and he came back to kind of come underneath on an underneath crosser, and he just broke that thing up. That there were cheers, you know, he gave him a little bit of a pose, and I was like, okay, Jeff, and then he made a couple of other plays where he had, like, immediate run stops right after the catch. You saw the recovery speed, which is probably the thing that you should just look for. Say with Jeff Okuda, there's things he's got to polish up, but if he comes back athletically, the same as he was before this last injury, this, this very bad injury he had to deal with week one against San Fran, He's going to be very good. He's going to be a problem because athletically, he is different than a lot of other guys. He is one of the fastest cornerbacks on our team in terms of 40 time. He is athletically extremely gifted. The quickness in his feet, the length that he has, the physicalness that he has. The guy can play. I'm telling you, he's going to be very good as long as he's healthy. So to see here that there's recovery speed and he's getting back into place, and we've seen this. Like It's not like rare. I'm not saying he's elite speed, but we saw week one when he recovered on a crossing route and broke it up. He can do things like that. So with that said, Jeff Okuda, definitely a good sign that, you know, he's making plays like that because that points to the athleticism. He continues to rotate as of now with Will Harris, and I just know from individual drills, Will Harris look good. I can't tell you as much about the team drills, but in individual drills, Will Harris... He looks much, much more fluid than I remember seeing the film of last year. So he definitely seems taken, been putting in a lot of time there. And shout out to Will Harris, man. He took a picture with me. I appreciate Will Harris. I, that's one. That's one that I had wrote down. I was like, man, I got to get a picture with Will Harris. I want to get a picture with Will. Jamar Jefferson, man. I, come on, man. I need this thing signed. I'm going to wear it until I get it signed, man. I'm just saying. A little bit of a battle between uh, Amani and DJ Chark. I guess the, uh, the first play, it was a beautiful throw by Jared Goff. Put it on DJ Chark, and DJ Chark dropped it. I didn't see the drop, but I did see the very next play where DJ Chark ran kind of an outbreaking route medium out breaking route Amani was in really tight coverage like he had really tight coverage but DJ Chark came through in a contested situation from Jared Goff and you need to make those plays where it's tight coverage how can a quarterback trust to try to thread the needle in tight coverage if you're not going to go take that football you know who did that Quintus Cephas Quintus Cephas took it out of tight coverage so you could trust to put it up there and we saw Jared Goff very quickly trust to put it in those tight window throws just look at Minnesota week five with that said, DJ Chark came back, had a really nice contested grab in tight coverage. So there was definitely a lot of screen plays and coming off of play action. There's a lot of screens. The first play, apparently, it was, was you know, we got to see Hutchinson matched up with Sewell for the first time because Hutchinson's been working against the left tackle, as we kind of predicted. This play, they went with that screen to kind of throw off Aiden Hutchinson. The guy that I, do, I will point out, same that someone that stuck out to me today, DeAndre Swift. Some of these plays probably were blown dead, but man, DeAndre Swift, he looked fast. He looked fast. There was one play when I saw DeAndre Swift running, and I know Godwin's got speed. So I'm looking out there. I'm like, oh, man, Godwin. That must have been Godwin that just broke through there. And then I see him run back, and I'm like, oh, that was DeAndre Swift. That was that was Swift? He was moving. DeAndre Swift was moving. He had won the wide run to the left on the outside, and he just popped outside, and it was just boom, gone. I mean, he was like 25, 30 yards that he picked up before anybody could even cut him off. DeAndre Swift showed some burst there. There was another play, I don't think it was blown dead, where someone just popped into the backfield immediately, and you saw him slam on the brakes, cut back, and work back the other way, pick up a few yards. The explosiveness is legit in person. He looks extremely explosive from what I've seen so far. So far, you saw it on screens as well. He looks big time explosive. Craig Reynolds does seem to be the third st third string running back right now as he got some reps with them. But it's a very good coverage rep from Derek Barnes underneath. He played a nice little uh, underneath crosser from a running back really well, kind of swallowed that up. And there was a couple of plays like that underneath that were just closed off early. A couple of the screens gave up big plays, and there was a couple of other times where they were just closed off. Whether that be Jeff Okuda, Derek Barnes, someone underneath. Levi Onsrique had a 
pass batted down at the line of scrimmage so that was cool to see i thought it was a lean initially i'm like oh there, there goes the ball it was levi that knocked it down that was an underneath little like spot route it looks like they were throwing to dj chark one thing schematically that i think i saw i think i did i'll keep an eye on for it that i think i saw because this is something that the Rams did a ton with Jared Goff, especially when they would spread you out, is they would have kind of like a concept going one side of the field where Jared Goff would look, and pre-snap, you have to give him answers, right? You have to kind of give him a feel of, okay, is this man, is this zone, where should I look? He would go there. If he didn't have it, he could come back, and a lot of times they would utilize Cooper Cup on kind of a double move underneath, like an arrow route, get outside, bam, break back inside, and if it wasn't there, he'd be able to come back and hit it, and I think David Blau hit a route like that to Josh Johnson kind of on an arrow route. I think it was Josh Johnson. I couldn't tell exactly who it was, but but that looked like a kind of an L.A. Rams type of play. So they said, you know, obviously that they, they're doing a lot of things that he did had success with, with the Rams. That's one thing he had success with, with the Rams. It always gave him kind of a safety blanket where if you try to get the answer pre-snap and it wasn't there, the safety blanket was able to get to that third option and check it down, third, fourth option, which was kind of a double move timing route breaking over the middle. That was kind of your safety blanket. And I think that makes a lot of sense specifically when you get man coverage, right? Because if you have a route combination set up to defeat zone coverage, you come back because it's man coverage then you have this little route that should beat man coverage as long as you put a really big weapon that's tough to match up with there or a very shifty receiver on a linebacker a safety something like that and that's what it looked like to me they did a 57 second drive with david blau towards the end of practice the first play was complete deep middle the second play was a sack i believe it was a sack it left him with 34 seconds the next play was a, a pretty big gain to craig reynolds which i'm actually sure was the screen that picked up the first like i said he had a couple big plays they weren't anticipating that then he came back with a throwaway 19 seconds on the clock and incomplete underneath was mike hughes in coverage that led to third down then there was that pressure we talked about kind of off his back foot heaved up a deep like deep kind of corner route to Khalif Raymond that fell incomplete and that led to a field goal attempt which was good and the special teams notes that we have from today I actually thought it was the other way around but I'm glad someone got a better angle of this because when they were practicing cyber Riley, they look good. Cyber definitely seemed to have the much bigger leg. I think Cyber practiced one from like the 40-yard, 5-yard line. I don't know if he made it or not, but I did see him kick it. I'm like, oh my gosh, did he make that? Because that, I mean, that's that's a long way. That's well over 50 yards. But when they got into the team drills and they hopped in, uh, the field goal results are as follows. Riley Patterson was 4 for 4. Austin Cyber was 3 for 4, according to Pride of Detroit. I thought it was the other way around, but shout out to them. The one miss was a 43-yarder by Austin Cyber, which actually just banged right off the left upright. Just boom. Riley Patterson actually went 4 for 4, and he knocked through a 54-yard field goal. 54-yard field goal for Riley Patterson. That's huge because he didn't make his 50-plus yarder last year. That was the only kick that he didn't make. He was perfect outside of that. So the length was always there. Austin Seibert seems to have the bigger leg, but I mean, 50, if you can knock down a 54, five, if, you, if I can trust you knock down a 55, 54 yard kick, that's all the leg that I feel like you need. I mean, yeah, you like to have a Justin Tucker that maybe rarely could knock through a 65 yard field goal. Austin Seibert may have that, but if I can get a guy that can knock down 54 yards and I feel pretty good and confident that I can put him out there and give him a chance, that works for me. I think that's all you need. But yeah, the quarterback seemed to be pretty flowing well. Jared Goff seems to be flowing really well within this offense. DJ Chark definitely seems like he'd be a big part. You kind of have a feel of who the top four receivers are. But I love the fact that after you know practice, there was kind of like a time point and everybody was putting in work. So Amani and Jeff Okuda were doing some drills together. So I guess that does say that Amani was doing okay because they were doing some one-on-one -on -one drills together after practice. You got really drills everywhere. You got the mentors helping out. You had Charles Harris working with James Houston. You had the, the receivers catching from Jared Goff. You had guys everywhere kind of putting in some extra work in their own group. So you saw that after practice going on everywhere. And then, of course, they came around and took some pictures. Some of them did and things like that. But it was pretty awesome. This is really like a nice little little foundation that I can build upon now with some of my notes going forward. Now getting to see it for the first time on field. But I will be a different point of view. So trust me, the next time that I go, which is probably Monday, it will probably be my best takeaways video so far because I will have a much better view of everything going on and I'll be able to really get really good notes from everywhere. So comment down below if there's something specifically you want me to keep an eye on while I'm there. But with that being said, first day was success. Shout out to everybody that was there. I appreciate you saying what's up and shout out to the Lions. Shout out to Michael Banks. This was an awesome experience. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching and I'm out.